We did it. We got our hands on a lost Pokemon game, and we're leaking it in today's video. Not only are you going to see it in action, we're also going to show how you can play it for yourself. Maybe leak is the wrong word. We actually got it legit from one of the developers, so technically it's more like we're dumping it, along with all the raw files and concept art. But first, we're going to cover the full history of every cancelled game in the series. Pokemon Pink, Pokemon Picross, Pinball DS, Enhanced Editions of Fire Red and Leaf Green, and a couple more. We'll cover them all in chronological order, except the one we're dumping, because we want to save the best for last. A couple quick caveats before we get started, though. First, not all these games were technically cancelled. Every game had unique circumstances, but cancelled is a close enough blanket term we're using for games that never made it to store shelves. Some were more like failed pitches at Nintendo, while others were 100% finished but got locked away in a vault. Also, we're not going to cover Meowth's Party or Pikachu DS because they were just tech demos created to show off the capabilities of the GameCube and DS and were never meant to become full games. We're not covering Pocket Monsters 64 either, since its supposed existence seems to be based on decades-old misunderstandings from fans who thought a full Pokemon RPG was in the works for N64, but in reality that game was just Pokemon Stadium. Okay, with all that said and the intro out of the way, let's start off by dissecting Pokemon Pink which it appears Game Freak planned to release alongside Pokemon Yellow in 1998. In other words, Pokemon Pink and Yellow would have been paired releases, just like Red and Green. Fans had no idea about Pink until April 2020, when source code for Blue and Yellow leaked on 4chan. There were all kinds of interesting finds in the code, like unused Pokemon sprites and audio files showing pretty much every Pokemon was intended to say its name. All those voices got cut, probably because they were cursed, so in the final game, the only Pokémon who talks is Pikachu. The source code also contained a couple references to a non-existent Pokémon game, like a header for quote, Pocket Monsters Pink and Yellow. Notice how pink comes first. There's another line that mentions pink and yellow packages. For comparison, here's what the equivalent code looks like in earlier games basically identical, except it says red and green packages. To explain packages in layman's terms, red and green are both built from the same source code, but which package identifier gets ticked determines which game you can play on a Game Boy cartridge. If the red package is ticked, the game boots up as Pokemon Red. So all signs point to Pink and Yellow being another paired release, and in that regard you could say Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee are their spiritual successors. We talked to the cutting room floor admin Huguette Hikari to explain technical details, and she said they experimented with changing the package from yellow to pink to see if it'd magically unlock a lost Pokémon game. Unfortunately, and unsurprisingly, it didn't work, but it was worth a shot. We can't say for certain, but it appears Pokémon Pink was likely scrapped very early in development, since these two lines of code are the only evidence of its existence. The Pokémon companies only mentioned Pokémon Pink in one interview, and we'll get to that in a minute, but without more info from them or Game Freak, it's impossible to say how Pink would have been different from Yellow. Presumably, the game and a lot of the sprites would have had a pink palette. Some fans believe Jigglypuff would have appeared on the game's box art, considering its prominent role in the anime, and that Pikachu and Jigglypuff were the only two Pokémon fighters in the original Super Smash Bros. Like maybe those two were chosen for Smash because at the time they were set to star in two upcoming Pokémon games. But the most popular theory is that Clefairy would have been the star, because the Japanese version of the Game Boy Camera had this frame of Pikachu and Clefairy together, which got removed from later international releases, but more importantly because the 1996 Pocket Monster manga that predates the anime starred Clefairy and Trainer Red. Some fans speculate that while Pokémon Yellow uses elements from the anime, like a Pikachu partner, Team Rocket, Nurse Joy, or Officer Jenny, Pokémon Pink would have been more like the manga, and also maybe cater more to female fans, which was an explicit priority for the franchise at the time. After the leak dropped on 4chan, 4chaners started making a Pokémon Pink ROM hack to bring that vision to life with a female player character, but ultimately it was never finished. The Pokémon Company never addressed the leak. We did, however, find one instance where the words Pokémon Pink crossed the lips of company president Tsunekazu Ishihara. In a Japanese interview from 2000 we had translated, Ishihara and series creator Satoshi Tajiri explained Gen 1 and 2's development. We'll make the full translation publicly available, linked below if you want to read it. Regarding Pink, though, he says, quote, We made red and green, then after that we made blue. Later we made yellow, and it might have been nice if the next games were called pink or purple, but if we did that, all we'd be doing is perpetually making extensions of the originals. In context, he's explaining why the next games were called Gold and Silver, 
so they could keep using colors while also signaling to customers that Gen 2 is more impressive than Gen 1. But Ishihara's sentiment that pink or purple might have just been perpetually making extensions of the originals might also apply to why pink got cancelled, because there were already four versions of Gen 1 and a fifth version would have been overkill. Not just for the fans, but also for Game Freak. They needed to devote more resources to making Gen 2, which ended up releasing two years behind schedule, even without getting slowed down making Pink. Maybe we're reading too much into that quote, but regardless, that was indeed the situation. The most pessimistic view was voiced by Huguette Hikari, who said it's possible Pink was never anything at all, not even an idea. A lot of source code was copy-pasted to make yellow, so maybe Game Freak's programmers just deleted the words red and green and replaced them with pink and yellow without much thought. If that's really all that happened, Pokémon fans have spent the last few years theorizing about nothing. And somewhere out there, Ishihara's laughing his ass off at our expense. Hopefully not, though, and someday he'll reveal a big binder about pink on Japanese TV, like he did a few years back with all those Kapumon sprites. Next up is a game we can say with 100% certainty did exist because the full game leaked online two decades after it was cancelled, playable from start to finish, even the credits. Pokémon Picross was a Game Boy Color puzzler first announced in Japanese magazines in 1999, which showed off screenshots and some original artwork. The game was developed by Jupiter Corporation, the same guys who made the Pokémon Pinball spin-offs, or at least the two pinball games that didn't get cancelled. More on that later. Jupiter created the Picross series a few years earlier, and it sold well enough that they released about 40 more Picross games up to the present day. They've crossed over with Mario and Zelda, and briefly with Pokémon in Picross NP Volume 1, a Super Famicom game only available via the Japanese Nintendo Power Service. But there was also a full Pokémon game that slipped through the cracks. Picross's gameplay is kinda hard to explain and we don't want to bore you, so simply put, it's kinda like Minesweeper, or Sudoku with less math. If you're interested in learning, Pokémon Picross comes with a tutorial taught by Professor Oak, and after the leak, the community took it upon themselves to release an English fan translation. The game's got an original 23-piece soundtrack, that's what you're hearing now. In addition to Oak, it's got Pikachu, Misty, Team Rocket, locations all around Kanto, and lots of anime references. You can also get Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle as partner Pokémon, which change the border colors to green, red, and blue. Interestingly, you can also get Clefairy and Jigglypuff as partner Pokémon, which changes the border to pink or purple. Hmm, pink or purple? Anyway, it's a good little puzzle game and pretty addictive. In 2015, Jupiter released a different Pokémon Picross game for 3DS that got pretty good review scores. Unfortunately, it was digital only, so nowadays it's impossible to download on your 3DS, since Nintendo shut down the eShop in 2023. You can catch both games online, though, if you're up for sailing the high seas. Not that we condone piracy, of course. And now for something completely different a pitch within Nintendo to develop upgraded Chinese editions of Fire Red and Leaf Green. We don't want to get lost in the weeds with the entire history of Nintendo in China, but long story short, in 2000 the Chinese government instituted a ban on consoles entering China because they thought addictive video games were melting the brains of Chinese youth. A couple years later, Nintendo managed to sidestep some of those laws by partnering with a Chinese national to found a new company called iQ. IQ went on to produce Chinese versions of Nintendo consoles, including the Game Boy Advance, and localized some of their games for the Chinese market. In 2020, IQ was hacked and a lot of their records leaked online. Among all those documents was a PowerPoint presentation that IQ presented to Nintendo executives in 2004, outlining their plan to develop Chinese versions of red and green that would have implemented some remarkable upgrades. For the most part, these still would have been the same exact Fire Red and Leaf Green released around the world, collecting Pokémon, going town to town collecting badges, and so on, but with new features added, mostly focused on internet functionality. For example, the games would identify the player's location and change the in-game weather to match the real-life weather outside. Previous Pokémon games already had a day-night cycle based on real time, but this would have taken it to the next level. Specific Pokémon's locations around Kanto would have changed depending on real-life location as well. Details aren't spelled out in the document, but it sounds like a prototype of Pokémon Go in that respect, with players needing to go here and there to catch them all. Pokémon centers would also be expanded, with only 30 Pokémon storable offline, but tons more stored online in Pokémon Center PCs, sort of like an early version of Pokémon Home. 
On the second floor of these expanded Pokémon centers, fans could battle on the internet. And not just the kind of online battles later introduced in Gen 4, instead, gameplay would switch to a computer screen, and you'd use the GBA as a controller. Battles would use Pokémon Coliseum's code, so all Pokémon and environments would be fully 3D. There'd also be online distributions of special Pokémon and items, which wasn't a thing in Pokémon games till the DS era. But instead of Nintendo just giving you special Pokémon, you'd go to completely new parts of Kanto to hunt for them. So kinda like the Sevi Islands for catching Mew and Deoxys that were already special events in Fire Red and Leaf Green. But IQ said new areas would also get added gradually after launch. Needless to say, these enhanced ports would have been far ahead of their time, with features not seen in Pokémon games till years in the future. Or in some cases, still haven't been seen even today, almost 20 years later. There also would have been some other small tweaks like egg hatching variables, and of course the text would have all been Chinese. So why didn't Chinese Fire Red and Leaf Green get made? The leak doesn't say. But if we had to guess, the Pokémon company didn't want to hand over the keys to their precious IP. We wanted to know for sure though. We didn't want to just guess. One of the guys who makes up Did You Know Gaming lives in China, so he went looking for former IQ developers to find the story. He couldn't nail down a concrete answer on this project specifically, and the devs didn't want their names on record, but they did share a story that shed light on how relations broke down between China and the Pokémon Company around that time. Long story short, Nintendo President Iwata, Pokémon Company President Ishihara, and some other execs flew out to IQ's headquarters. The execs ultimately decided too many Chinese people were pirating Nintendo games, so it just wasn't worth investing in the Chinese market anymore. IQ only released a few more Nintendo games after that, then lots more that were previously planned ended up being canned, including a fully finished localization of Ruby and Sapphire. It's a shame those upgraded versions of Fire Red and Leaf Green never got made, but most of us can't speak Mandarin anyway, and even less have access to Chinese servers, so you probably couldn't have played them anyway. Pokémon Pinball for Game Boy was one of the earliest and most beloved spin-offs in the franchise, and its GBA sequel got review scores on par with the mainline series. But after that, the series just kinda died off. Unknown to the public, though, a playable demo for a third entry on Nintendo DS was developed in secret. The Pokémon Company said they were the best graphics they'd ever seen outside Japan, but sadly, the game was never finished. Fans first became aware of the project thanks to a leak in 2021 which included a spreadsheet saying Pokémon Pinball DS was planned to release around the same time as Diamond and Pearl, and that it was being developed by Fuse Games, the same team who made Mario Pinball Land and Metroid Prime Pinball. No other information was available, so we searched out the devs to learn more about it. Fuse shut down almost 15 years ago, but we managed to get in contact with their artist Matthew Nightingale, one of nine guys who worked on Pokémon Pinball DS. He told us it would have been more of an adventure game, similar to their take on Metroid. He believed it was the quality of their Metroid adaptation that led Nintendo and the Pokémon Company to come visit Fuse's office in England, and fund the development of a playable demo with three stages. To help you visualize Matthew's description of the game, we commissioned artwork for all three stages. The first stage was Sinnoh's Countryside. The time spent playing on this table represented the amount of time it took to travel from one city to the next. Pokémon appear on the table as you travel down the route, like Diglett Bumpers or Pikachu up a tree. You hit Pokémon with the Pokéball to stun it, then tap it with your finger to catch it. If you didn't click quick enough, it runs away. After enough time's gone by, the city gates open and you shoot the pinball inside to progress to the next table, the city stage. Catching Pokémon's simpler and faster than the older games, so by the time you're through the countryside and the city, you've collected enough Pokémon to form a team. Then it's time to progress to the demo's final table, where you fight a gym leader. Out of all the Pokémon you've caught, you need to decide which ones to take into battle, ideally with type advantages like water versus fire. The gym stage is double-ended. On one end, you have your flippers with a Pokémon between them, and on the other end is the gym leader's Pokémon. You power up your attacks by hitting the ball to certain parts of the table. Then once you've charged up enough power, you fire your ball into a hole to make your Pokémon attack. The table only has one ball so if you lose control of it, the gym leader can get a hold of it to charge his own attacks. Pokémon Pinball DS also would have had Wi-Fi multiplayer battles that played out just like gym battles. Matthew says the game also would have had an evolution mechanic, and probably would have come bundled with a rumble pack you plugged into the GBA slot. Nintendo and the Pokémon Company were really impressed with the demo, but for some reason they never greenlit the project for full production, so nothing got made beyond the playable demo. 
Matthew wasn't invited to that high-level meeting, but he suspects it came down to contract disputes. Pokemon pinball games didn't exactly print money like the core series does, so there wouldn't have been as much to go around for all parties involved. Fuse ended up going bankrupt in 2009 partly because Pokemon Pinball didn't go to market. No one else from Fuse, including the former owners, were willing to share more details with us. As for where that demo is now, well, it's probably out there somewhere. We asked Matthew if it was lost to time after Fuse went out of business, but he said no. Nintendo paid for its development, so they must still have it in their possession. Leaks of early Pokemon prototypes are becoming more common these days, so who knows? Maybe someday it'll find its way online and we'll all get to play it. Next up is Pokemon Grey. The game fans were expecting after Black and White, but were surprised when they got Black 2 and White 2 instead. It was long dismissed as baseless fan expectations, but we did a half-hour expose on Grey last year with evidence to the contrary. You can go watch last year's longer video if you want, but we'll summarize the highlights here and add some new info. In a 2012 issue of Nintendo Dream we had translated, series director Junichi Masuda said, During Black and White's development, we were thinking about making another version and weren't thinking about making a direct sequel or making two different versions. Honestly, while we were making Black and White, we weren't thinking about making a two at all. But we already had a general idea that Curum would play an important role alongside Zekrom and Reshiram. We went digging for old filings, and here's receipts showing that a couple months after releasing Platinum, they registered URLs for Pokémon Black, White, and Grey and also registered trademarks for all three colors, along with a few others, like Scarlet and Crimson. The site PokemonGray.com actually existed at one point, though just as a placeholder. There's also a few traces of Gray hiding in Black and White's internal data. Those games feature two key items called Dragon Stones, the Dark Stone which is Zekrom in its dormant state, and the Light Stone for Reshiram. The data also contains a third key item called the God Stone, which was gray in color and presumably once meant for Curum, but it ended up going unused. Black and White's internal data also contains a table that reveals how many forms every Pokémon has, and how many Game Freak was planning they will have in the future. Interestingly, the table suggests Game Freak didn't know how many forms Curum was going to have in the next game. This lines up with another quote from Masuda, where he says they knew from the beginning Curum would fuse with other Pokémon in the next game but didn't necessarily know he'd fuse with Zekrom and Reshiram specifically. At the time they were making Black and White, they were open to the idea of Curum fusing with other Pokémon as well. The 3DS came out a few months after Black and White, so fans expected Grey was going to launch on Nintendo's new handheld and not the old, basically retired DS. But in a Famitsu magazine we translated, Masuda says that was never going to happen. At the time, there were 150 million DSs in the hands of consumers, but not even 20 million 3DSs. Game Freak could sell exponentially more copies on older hardware because of the larger install base, and they could make even more money releasing two games instead of one. So they went to Pokémon Company President Ishihara to see if he agreed. Recounting that meeting, Masuda said, Every time we finish a game's development, we're left with a feeling that there are still things left unfinished. As development on Black and White was wrapping up, we were just starting to come up with lots of fun new ways to make the two versions more distinct. There was no way we could implement them in time for Black and White's release, so we gave up on including them, even though we'd really wanted to. So at that point, we decided to make two versions of the next game, but we hadn't decided they'd be sequels yet. When we talked to Ishihara, he said, If it's going to be on DS instead of 3DS, I want some kind of new innovation added to it. It was then we came up with the idea of numbering for the first time in the series. So with a plot set two years after Black and White, and a development time of two years, we felt like we wanted to add the number two into the titles as well. That meeting was pretty much the nail in the coffin for Pokémon Grey, and by our math, releasing two games instead of one made them about $100 million more in revenue. As far as how Grey might have been different from Black 2 and White 2, besides packing everything into a single title, the sequel's director Takao no clued us in on Famitsu. He said his plan to make them different from a typical third version came down to three core pillars, new protagonists, new towns, and a new adventure taking place two years in the future. In other words, Grey probably would have starred Hilbert and Hilda, had the same towns, and taken place the same year as the originals. So basically a Gen 5 version of Pokémon Platinum. 
there also wouldn't have been a continuation of N's story. Masuda says they originally wanted to leave N's whereabouts a mystery at the end, just flying away on his dragon to who knows where. But fans loved the character so much they felt they had no choice but to bring him back in the sequels. So for Black 2 and White 2, they had him return to save Kurum from Getsis, help you obtain the legendary dragons, then just kinda retire to his castle. But initially, the plan was to never see him again after he flies away and leave his destiny up to fan imagination. But actually, N super fans might be interested to hear we might not have seen the last of him just yet. When Black 2 and White 2 was released, Masuda was asked if fans might eventually see one more pair of sequels with Black 3 and White 3. He said, If in the future we feel that we want to continue, perhaps we'll have a continuation. But we're really satisfied with how Black 2 and White 2 have turned out, so perhaps not. That interview was more than 10 years ago, so maybe Game Freak's come around since then. Who knows, maybe that's what we'll get instead of Gen 5 remakes. And now for Pokemon Z. We found out Game Freak's official explanation in a 2016 Spanish magazine where the interviewer asks why Z never happened. Masuda says, We never really plan to make a third version. We always want to do things that surprise our fans. For example, after Black and White, people thought Pokemon Grey was going to come next, but instead we made Black and White too. People thought Pokemon Z would come after X and Y, but taking advantage of the fact it's the 20th anniversary, we decided to deliver another surprise with Sun and Moon. In other words, instead of Z, they released a brand new generation to celebrate Pokemon's birthday in 2016. But to us, that sounds like corporate deflection, because what he said isn't actually consistent with series history. In all three previous generations, a paired release was followed up with a return to the same region about two years later. X and Y came out in 2013, so Z should have launched in 2015, not 16. In fact, 2015 was conspicuously the only year in almost a decade that didn't get a new mainline entry. And it's not just Game Freak's release schedule that suggests something's missing. There's also data hidden in their own games. We broke this down in exhaustive detail in that half-hour expose last year, so for this video, we'll give you the short version. In a combination of data mining X and Y's internal data and a leak of Sun and Moon's source code, it was revealed inside those games was a list of every Pokemon game, including some that wouldn't come out till years later. The purpose of those lists was to facilitate games connecting to each other, like trading and battling. Sun and Moon's code showed placeholder data for virtual console versions of Gold, Silver, and Crystal, which hadn't been announced yet, as well as two games called Alola Reserve, which eventually became Ultra Sun and Moon. Similarly, there were two entries called Kalos Reserve, positioned as if they were going to release in 2015. All seven games in the data eventually did come out, except the two Kalos games. So actually, Game Freak's programmers weren't just reserving space for Pokemon Z, they were making room for two games. Two games make more money than one, after all. Surely there wouldn't have been two Pokemon Zs, maybe X2 and Y2, or XZ and YZ with the Zs stylized to look like twos. There's no evidence for what they would have been called, though, so for the sake of simplicity, we'll just refer to them collectively as Pokemon Z for the rest of this video. The anime shines even more light on that Z-shaped hole in 2015. Historically, new seasons sync up with new game releases. The first episode of the Black and White anime aired the same week as Black and White the Games, Black and White anime season 2 broadcast the same week as Black 2 and White 2, the XY anime and games also released the same week. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire launched with the episode where pretty much all the new Mega Evolutions made their anime debuts. And finally, the XYZ anime aired its first episode in October 2015, which is when Zygarde's 10% and 50% forms made their first appearance, along with Zygarde cores and Zygarde cells. The animes all planned out long in advance, so it appears Pokemon Z was originally scheduled to launch alongside the XYZ anime in 2015. Zygarde only played a small role in X and Y, just waiting in a post-game cave with no story connected to it. Basically the same role Kurum had in Black and White, which got more fleshed out in the sequels. Fans expected a similarly expanded role for Zygarde in Z. An X version's Pokédex seemed to hint in that direction when it said, quote, When the Kalos region's ecosystem falls into disarray, Zygarde appears and reveals its secret power. But that never happened, so two new Zygarde forms, cores, and cells found their way into Sun and Moon instead. There's also some unused content in X and Y's internal data that suggests Game Freak was planning more for Kalos, at least at the time those games were in development, like AZ's Floette, which has unique stats, a signature attack called Light of Ruin, and even its own cry in X and Y's internal data, none of which ever got used. X and Y's data also has two moves for Zygarde, Thousand Arrows and Thousand Waves that didn't get used either. 
A similar thing happened in Gen 5 when freeze burn and ice shock were found in Black and White's internal data, but didn't get added as Kurum's signature attacks until Black 2 and White 2. That the same thing happened twice suggests Game Freak may have originally intended Thousand Arrows and Thousand Waves for Pokémon Z. Z never came out though, so those attacks got introduced in Sun and Moon instead. All that evidence strongly suggests Game Freak intended to make Z while they were developing X and Y. So, why didn't they? We spent about five minutes getting overly thorough in last year's video, so this time we'll just give you the short version. Simply put, it's got a lot to do with the Gear Project. Basically, it's a Game Freak company initiative that aimed to make a new franchise that could become even more popular than Pokémon. According to one of Game Freak's directors, Masayuki Onoe, there are two different production teams here, simply named Production Team 1 and Production Team 2. Team 1 is fully dedicated to Gear Project, while Team 2 is for the Pokémon operation. What that means is that Game Freak as a company is prioritizing Gear Project, which is production team number one, more than Pokémon in general. We're always trying to create something that is equally exciting or more exciting than Pokémon. In other words, for a good chunk of the 2010s, they were devoting lots of resources to making non-Pokémon games, like the rhythm platformer Harmonite, quirky horse racer Pocket Card Jockey, side-scroller Tembo the Badass Elephant, and puzzle platformer Giga Wrecker. The Gear Project was at its most active in the Gen 6 era, when those same devs could have been making Pokémon Z. Some of Game Freak's top talent worked on Gear Project games, like the directors of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, and Ultra Sun and Moon. The teams who made Gear games were small, but Z could have been made with a small team as well, and pretty quickly. Aorus, for example, was developed in just a year. In another Nintendo Dream we translated, Masuda says Heart Gold and Soul Silver were made with just 12 developers, and Black 2 and White 2 had a similarly small team. Pokémon games grew their staff by 50% when they switched from 2D to 3D, so back at the napkin math, Z could have gotten made by 20 devs, 30 on the high end. Game Freak staff have said in quite a few interviews that they're kind of tired of just making Pokémon year after year, and frankly, we can't blame them. They needed to recharge their batteries, learn some new skills, and work on something different for a change. Regrettably, their hopes of producing something more exciting than Pokémon didn't pan out. Gear Project games got decent reviews, but hardly anyone bought them. Talking to Famitsu, Masuda said, Only one out of 50 Pokémon fans have played them. I've tried to tell our fans please try this one out, but the message didn't sink in. By all appearances, when Game Freak was making X and Y, they figured Z'd come next, but when the time came, they were too thin and stretched with the Gear Project. To be fair to Game Freak, though, prioritizing failed games over Pokémon probably wasn't the only reason we never got Z. There's likely some off-the-record factors we couldn't dig up, like personal interests or office politics. Unfortunately, they don't seem interested in sharing that story with the public. You might be wondering how much of Z actually got made. Well, based on our findings, it doesn't appear Z was ever in active development. We got help from data miners to look through Gen 7's source code, but couldn't find evidence any code got copy-pasted from Z. Possibly some ideas got recycled, some Zygarde stuff, but not much actual work. Aside from sparse data and leftovers, and inferences based on series history and the XYZ anime, it's doubtful we'll ever know what Z might have become. Maybe Game Freak didn't know either. Probably over-optimistic wishful thinking on our part, but hopefully someday they'll figure it out and make it an episode in the eventual Gen 6 remakes. With Generations 5 and 6 out of the way, now let's move on to Gen 7. The same day Sun and Moon launched in 2016, Eurogamer reported that an enhanced version of Sun and Moon codenamed Pokémon Stars was coming to Switch the following year. The article's author, deputy editor Tom Phillips, claimed to have several sources for the story, and at least one was saying the Switch edition would add new Pokémon. Fans were excited to hear Alola was coming to an HD console, which presumably meant we'd get to explore Alola in a higher resolution than the 3DS's meager 240p. Some fans even cancelled their plans to buy Sun and Moon to wait for stars instead. Hype continued to build over the next few months, especially when the Pokémon Company announced a new campaign called Look Upon the Stars, which saw the release of an entire line of Stars-themed merch. Series director Junichi Masuda made a tweet starting with the words Pokémon Stars that some fans saw as a teaser for things to come. Anticipation peaked in mid-2017 when Amazon UK started selling pre-orders for Pokémon Stars. It appeared to be just a placeholder, as there was no box art and the release date was January 2030. But that didn't stop Stars from climbing the sales charts and reaching number 87 on Amazon's video game bestsellers list. Official confirmation seemingly arrived when Ultra Sun and Moon were announced, and the Pokémon Company's website said they were coming to Switch at a later date. 
They quickly deleted the Switch reference and put out a statement saying it was a clerical error, but some fans believe the slip-up was stars getting revealed earlier than intended. Ultra Sun and Moon were, after all, very similar to how Eurogamer described Pokémon Stars. An expansion of Sun and Moon, with some new Pokémon added, launching Holiday 2017. The main difference was that there were two games instead of one, and of course the platform they launched on. So to some, a Switch release still seemed likely. One detail that went unreported all these years is that the Pokémon company fired the team responsible for the website saying Ultra Sun and Moon were coming to Switch. We couldn't 100% confirm it was because of that mistake, but they got replaced right after it happened. So it certainly appears that's why they were gotten rid of. Another point of note, we talked earlier about how Sun and Moon's source code contained two then-unreleased games codenamed Alola Reserve. Those eventually became the Ultra games, but they were reserved spots. It's possible Game Freak only would have filled one of those reservations and left the other unused. On the other hand, if Pokémon Stars actually did exist, it's possible it was a code name for two Switch games, not necessarily just one. Regardless, eventually it became clear Stars was never coming. One year after his original 2016 article, Eurogamer's Tom Phillips returned with a post-mortem titled, So what happened with Pokémon Stars? The internet had been ripping him a new one all year, so understandably he felt he owed an explanation. Long story short, he said his sources indicated that Stars' cancellation was primarily a casualty of Nintendo's business strategy. After the failure of the Wii U, Nintendo originally wanted to release their three biggest IP for Switch year one, Zelda, Mario, and Pokémon. But plans changed after the Switch exploded in popularity. And the problem wasn't that Nintendo couldn't sell them, it was that they were selling out of them and couldn't even make enough to keep up with demand. They didn't need to play their trump card anymore. In fact, it would have only made the Switch shortages worse. So instead, Ultra Sun and Moon and a few other big titles like Metroid Samus Returns were released throughout 2017 to keep the 3DS on life support, as a backup plan in case the Switch couldn't carry the company all on its own. Nintendo's official position at the time was that both consoles would exist side by side, and the Switch wasn't a replacement for 3DS. Eurogamer also said an HD 3DS port selling for $60 could have made the Switch look bad in its first year, which was another factor in stars being canned. Understandably, some folks were pessimistic about Eurogamer's reporting, with some even accusing Eurogamer of making it all up for clicks. In the interest of presenting both sides, we should give some time to the rumor's most prominent critic, Serebi webmaster Joe Merrick. He publicly accused Eurogamer of spreading BS and fake rumors, and argued with Tom Phillips in his article's comment section. Now with almost five years as hindsight, we talked to Joe and asked what he makes of the rumor. He told us he thought Sun and Moon might have been ported to Switch purely for the sake of testing and was never meant to become an actual product for sale. Maybe someone at Nintendo saw it running on Switch in HD, got the wrong idea, and leaked it to Eurogamer. Or maybe, Joe says, Tom's source just made it all up. When we talked to Tom, he emphatically denied both possibilities, saying Eurogamer doesn't run stories based on a single source, and the typical requirement is three sources at minimum. He wouldn't reveal who his sources were, of course, but he did say they were in professional positions where mistaking a test port for a real game was next to impossible. To be fair to Tom, we should point out that he's got a pretty good track record. He was the first to report on the Switch's design and internal hardware specs, almost three months before they were officially revealed by Nintendo. He was also the first to report on the Super NES Classic, Diablo 3 on Switch, and quite a few other games long before they were officially announced. Not everything he's written about made their way onto store shelves, like an English localization of Mother 3, but suffice it to say there's a lot of clout chasers in the gaming industry with fake insider information. But Tom isn't one of them. He told us he stands by his post-mortem article and, for the record, reiterated that the Pokémon Company did originally plan to release the Stars Project on Switch in Holiday 2017. In an attempt to corroborate Tom's reporting, we reached out to about 50 devs who worked on Gen 7, but they all turned us down or didn't bother responding. Pokémon keeps their people on pretty tight lockdown, unfortunately. There sure was a lot of smoke, but we can't say conclusively if there was ever fire. Whether or not Pokémon Stars ever existed remains a mystery even to this day. For this last game, we just want to say right off the bat, it's been designated lost media for years, but we restored it. And as of today, it's been added to the Internet Archive. It ain't lost media anymore, and you can play it right now if you like. We'll talk about that more in a minute, but first let's look at the game itself. Pokémon 2000 Adventure was an officially licensed game that ended up being better than Nintendo expected it to be when they signed the contract, so they shut it down. 
but by then a million people had already played it. The history on this one is pretty unique. The second Pokémon movie, called Pokémon the Movie 2000, was distributed in America by Warner Brothers. Along with the movie, Nintendo fully licensed and gave permission for Warner Brothers to create promotional materials to sell more tickets. Nintendo were probably expecting posters, art, trailers, and maybe cheap web games, like Pikachu-themed Tic-Tac-Toe, but they weren't expecting Warner Brothers to spend millions producing a 3D Pokémon game. But that's exactly what Warner Brothers did. They contracted a studio called Cyberworld, who previously made virtual shopping malls, a Harry Potter game, and various other three-dimensional experiences. Think of them like Doom. 3D spaces populated with 2D sprites, but running in an internet browser. Pretty impressive back in the 90s. Warner Brothers wanted to use this cutting-edge technology to promote the new Pokémon movie. We talked to Eddie Ruminski, one of Cyberworld's developers. We launched it and we had about a million downloads in the span of a month, which is our most popular game to date. And that's when Nintendo freaked. And they immediately hit us with a cease and desist. They saw Warner Brothers breach the contract. They, they exceeded the contract's allowable scope, basically. Nintendo didn't expect that promotion to include something that was legitimately a video game. Back then, the only 3D Pokémon games that existed were Pokémon Snap and Pokémon Stadium, so Nintendo thought fans would see this first-person adventure and think it was a new direction the series was headed in. They considered it a threat and were concerned it would cause brand confusion. Eddie was sort of a junior programmer at the time, but he was the only guy at Cyberworld familiar with Pokémon. The company got a pre-release of Pokémon the Movie 2000, sat Eddie in front of it, and asked, how the hell do we turn this into a video game? After they bounced some ideas back and forth with Warner Brothers, here's what they came up with. What you're watching now is one of our playthroughs of Pokémon 2000 Adventure. The music you're hearing is the game soundtrack. The game begins with Professor Oak telling you there's a disturbance in the Force, and you've got to investigate. Then you pick one of three Pokémon teams, and a difficulty, beginner, intermediate, or advanced. Now your adventure begins, exploring three islands in any order you want. Your path forward is sometimes blocked by environmental obstacles that require Pokémon's special abilities to get past, like these volcanic lava plumes, for example. On our playthrough, we used Poliwhirl's water gun to extinguish the flames. Then he got experience points and evolved into Poliwrath. Eventually, we found Moltres. It asked us a trivia question about Lavender Town, and after we got it right, Moltres gave us a red ancient sphere. Then, on the next island, we used Lapras to freeze a lake and walk across it, melted an ice barrier with Vulpix, and answered Articuno's trivia question to get another sphere. On the final island, we cleared out some electric barriers and evolved a couple more Pokémon, and got the final sphere from Zapdos. Then, Professor Oak thanked us for saving the world and awarded us a certificate for beating the game. You can also get a final score and gold, silver, or bronze ranking, depending on how well you did. The game's only about 10 minutes, but there's some replayability thanks to having three Pokémon teams and three difficulty settings to choose from. By the time Nintendo struck down the game, the devs had already got paid, they got to see the movie before it hit theaters, and they got to say they'd worked on a massively successful Pokémon game. It was the greatest compliment via C Cease and Desist, saying, sorry, what you made was too much like a good video game. At the end of the day, when it was pulled, it was more like, we've already been paid. Like, that was a $2 million deal for that to make that game. Once it was pulled, it was like, we did the work, it was great, it was really popular. We hit the million downloads that we, like, didn't even dream of to begin with. So when it was pulled, we were all happy. Warner Brothers was happy too. With a million downloads, they got more promotion than they were expecting, and Pokémon 2000 went on to become the second highest grossing Japanese movie to ever hit American theaters. So really, everyone was happy except Nintendo. And if you want to play the game yourself, you'll be happy too, because here's directions on how you can play it right now. Eddie's been holding on to the raw files for the past 23 years. Then after he saw our video about restoring Pokémon Garden, he reached out and sent us all the files. One of the Pokémon Garden archivists, Rufus Ten, and his friend Doomtay, did some computer magic to get it working on the modern internet, which was a lot harder than it sounds. All credit goes to those guys. We were just sort of middlemen in the back and forth. We won't bore you with the technical restoration details, but like we said, it ain't lost media anymore, go play it if you want. Might want to be quick about it though, just in case Nintendo strikes it down again. 
for preservation's sake, we also archive the game's concept art, storyboards, soundtrack, and all the raw files. So even if it does get struck down, it'll always survive somewhere on the internet. Did you also know there were some Gen 3 era Flash games that only released in Japan, but have become lost media because no one bothered to back them up? Until now, that is. If you want to hear all about Pokemon Garden, Maze Land, and Sky Tower, click the video on screen. Special thanks to our translators, artists, and the devs who are willing to talk when all others refused. And thank you for watching. See you next time.